Cool. All right. So let's get started. Um, welcome. Thank you for starting your morning with us, everybody. Um, this is Listen Up, Kids Audio at Home, at School, and Beyond. Uh, we're going to go around and introduce ourselves, and then we're just going to have a really f fluid conversation about all that we are doing and interested in and wanting to share with all of you. So I'm Meredith Halpern Ranzer. I am the chief executive Tinker at Tinkercast. Um, Tinkercast is the company behind the number one podcast for kids and families wow in the world and a few other podcasts as well. Um, and we are excited to be talking about interactivity in the audio space and how to um, extend the funnel of podcasting into schools. Anne, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm Anne Richards. I'm a vice president at Fable Vision Studios, where I run Audio Yo, which is our audio division. We create and produce kids' podcasts. Um, and I am myself a writer and producer of podcasts, including Quinn and Alfie's ABC Adventures and the recent Yes No Audio Escape titles, which are um, both on Pinna. And I'm super excited to be here. I'm really passionate about making audio that meets kids in all the places they are, including the classroom. And uh, wonderful to be with this group of people and with all of you. Uh, Laura, i just pop it over to you. Thanks, Anne. Hi, I'm Laura Ordonez. I am head of podcast ratings and reviews for Common Sense Media. We're a leading ratings and reviews um, website and resource for families, educators, parents. We rate and review all sorts of media, TV, movies, games, all of it. And we just added podcasts in April, which is really exciting. I'm really excited to be here and offer a, a voice in this podcast space. So thank you for having me. Who are you passing to, Laura? Martin. <laughs> I'll pass to Martin. Thank you, Laura. Good morning. My name is Martin Tima. I'm a special education teacher coach in St. Paul, Minnesota. I was a special education teacher for seven years. I made a transition to being coach a few years ago. And um, let's see here. I think with podcasting, uh, I did a lot of that in my classroom. I'd make podcasts for my students. They would make podcasts themselves. And uh, I'm encouraging a lot of teachers that I work with to be using podcasts to, um, to increase listening comprehension. I will pass to Carol, last but not least. Hi, my name is Carol Patterson Wright. I am located in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, but I am a Vermonter always. Um, I am a teacher at a small independent school. I teach all grade levels, K through eight, uh, and I'm a science teacher. So I recently was involved with uh, Tinkercast and bringing podcasts into my classroom in a new way. I am beyond enthusiastic about the opportunity and um, really excited to do more and um, have already learned so much from the folks on the screen here. So make sure that you pay attention because they're phenomenal. So thank you. <laughs> so are you, Carol. <laughs> so um, yeah, so we wanted to start off by just talking about some of the research or things that we know um, cognitively about podcasts and usage. Um, does anyone want to start us off on that? Laura, do you want to want to kick that off? Or I, I can kick that off. Um, just based on, um, I think I would like to say on our side for Common Sense Media, not only do we have the ratings and reviews, but our um, Common Sense Education. So we've been working with them a lot in really trying to understand how to enter the classrooms and bring podcasts into the classroom that takes a lot of looking at research and like martin mentioned um, in his introduction um, there is a lot that has to do with listening comprehension and alongside listening comprehension comes reading comprehension so it's a great complement to the reading comprehension because if you think about it these kids are listening right especially if you're looking at the different ages at younger ages they're listening and they're getting that vocabulary exposure. They're getting the syntax. They're getting, they're hearing these words actually in context. So not only are they really having that active listening happening, but as they're learning to read, as their reading level increases, um, depending on, you know, where they're at, they can also kind of get the context of what's going on and hopefully be able to have that as a support for their reading 
comprehension, which is really amazing. And I think one of one of the one of the points of research I remember reading, I think it was in the International Journal of Listening. Um, I think it was from like 2016 that really just kind of went hand in hand with what we're talking about in the audio space um, is I think they said that they associated listening and engaging to stories, really listening and engaging to stories is positively associated with feeling psychologically safe and lessened social anxiety. And to me, the academics is so, it's great, but we look at what's going on in our society today and we look at the prevalence of mental health and social emotional well-being in kids, which is not something new. It's just something that's now being highlighted. Um, but the fact that that can help just in itself in listening, I think that speaks volumes to why podcasts can be impactful in another tool to really help um, in social emotional learning. That's awesome. Yeah. And something that um, there's also research that shows that kids can comprehend two to three grade levels higher when they are listening to something as opposed to reading, because as Laura was saying, they don't have to decode and encode words and they can get into, you know, higher levels of understanding um, more easily. And um, yeah, I'm curious if like the teachers have experienced any of that firsthand with their kids. Carol, want to go ahead? Oh, oh, you're okay. muted. <laughs> I guess I'll go. Um, so as a special education teacher, I work with a lot of students with reading goals. So they would have um, they would have needs in areas of comprehension or fluency or vocabulary. And yes, I um, saw a lot of students who would, with the act of reading, um, be at an instructional level that was lower than their grade level, but their listening comprehension was way higher. And so being able to give them engaging text, it was really helpful to provide um, podcasts so they can listen to things that were really interesting to them. And then also at their listening comprehension level. And then also um, one thing I wanted to add is, is that all pillars of literacy are really important. And so giving the confidence to be able to be involved with instructional text, or sorry, text that's at their, their level um, can get them excited about reading, get them engaged with reading, and then therefore be able to work on the hard stuff with their teacher and be able to work uh, so their, their reading is more um, um, leveled off or um, yeah, even with each other. Uh, to build on um, what you were saying about social emotional learning, um, as the coordinator in my school, I have a lot of experience in that area as well. And what I love about the podcast moment is that it creates a shared experience for your class. Um, together, we are all listening at the same time and receiving the same information. And I really enjoy that stepping off point uh, for the children in the room. And it transcends uh, grade levels. I really like that as well. You know, I can share a podcast with the kindergarten group and share the same podcast with the eighth grade uh, and they're both receiving uh, similar content, but experiencing it in completely different ways. Uh, as a science teacher, one of the most valuable things is the insertion of vocabulary. Um, I've been reading a lot of information about the importance of introducing big vocabulary to students at a young age and podcasts, going back to what you guys had said about um, you know, a kindergartner can't decode the words yet. They don't have the phonemic awareness. However, they can listen and they can hear. And with a facilitator in the room, you know, you can pause and talk about or follow up with it afterwards. And so it enriches vocabulary um, and creates a really equitable experience for all grade levels and all children and all levels in a classroom. Yeah, um, that made me think of an example of so when I, um, when I was teaching in the classroom, we would be doing co-teaching. So I would work with a general education teacher and the, the students would just see us as two teachers in the classroom. And it was a really good opportunity for us if students were creating podcasts on different topics. We used Wow in the World a lot um, just because nonfiction content was really good with a really easy way for students to gather just facts, just gather as many facts as possible on different topics. And so with that, with our classroom, it was an opportunity for students to share their knowledge and then share that with each other, ask questions, um, provide feedback to each other. And it was like one of those tools that help us have a more inclusive uh, community. 
That's awesome. Yeah. And we've heard um, from bringing WOW in the world into classrooms and doing testing, teachers were often surprised that some of their lower level students were actually engaged as engaged, if not more engaged with the content um, when it was delivered through audio. And, um, you know, another thing that I want to just point out, and I want to leave Anne some room too to speak, but um, podcasts also, um, if you, a parent, if a, sorry, if a teacher plays a video versus a podcast in class. Um, studies show that kids become more creative after listening to audio versus video afterwards. And so that's something that we're really excited about as we look at like 21st century learning and um, how we can help to help kids become those innovators and thinkers and tinkers that will be solving big problems tomorrow, you know, if they're listening to something about something really amazing going on in the world, it's what we're trying to present in Wow in the World, then we're hoping to help them springboard into be, being more creative and coming up with creative innovations and solutions to big problems through project-based learning after listening to the show too. So it's not just about the listening, but what can the listening then trigger in that classroom? What kind of projects can you do together or activities can you do beyond that podcast as well? And I would say sort of the listening itself also has that quality, right? Because you are co-creating, you know, kids, as someone who focuses a lot on preschool and makes a lot of narrative podcasts for kids, you know, having worked in television and interactive and media that is giving you more information, something I think is really special about podcasting is how much it asks kids to activate their imaginations and to fill in those other pieces. So it makes total sense to me that that, you know, extends not only after the listening, but during the listening um, as well. So, and it's as it's great to hear folks talk about literacy. So we went making Quentin and Alfie's ABC Adventures as Pinna came to me, Maggie and Amy came to me and said, you know, can you make an alphabet show that's an audio? And I was like, this is hard, <laughs> you know, you can't see the letters, but it was a, such a education for me. I work with Dr. Julie Wood, who's an awesome specialist in literacy education. And she really helped me think about how kids could experience letters and get excited about the sounds that they make, as opposed to kind of how I feel like I learned, which was the ABCs and looking at them and writing them out. And it was such a fun new angle on a topic that I feel like as folks who make kids media, we've engaged with over and over again, um, to really think about like, ah, is a really fun sound and all the ways that you can play that. And that's totally the hope is that we're getting kids excited about about language in a way that can then translate to an excitement about reading and, and to some of these more, you know, uh, harder skills as they as they grow in the classroom too. Awesome. And can I add one thing yeah. to to what Anne was saying too? What I think, even from a from a parent perspective, I think you know, from having my my son in class and he went from a, a private school to a public school and his reading level was just like absolutely way below when he came into the public school. And I was just like, so astonished. What, what hit me was his confidence level. Mm -hmm. His confidence was just not there. He was like, I have to be pulled out. I don't know how to read. And my thing is when listening and how we're seeing how that can help with reading comprehension, it really makes me realize that that word standardize is really difficult in the classroom. I'm sure Carol and Martin can really attest to that. And it must be difficult for teachers because different kids learn in different ways where as humans, we're not standardized, right? So being able to bring another tool from a toolkit in, I think says we want to be able to speak to different types of children in their different types of learning as well. It's an awesome, excellent point, Laura. And speaking about how to bring it in. So Laura, you said that you spoke to a lot of teachers recently and their first question was, well, how do I do this? So I'm wondering if the, um, Carol or Martin can maybe speak to like, how, how do you do this? How do teachers bring it into the classroom? I think I will say that um, Martin, um, when I met him in our initial conversations, I felt he had a lot more experience in this than I did. Um, and it was really inspiring to see that. I think that's what it is. You know, when you see another teacher doing it and they are confidently expressing it, that also fills you with confidence. But for me, um, you know, I, I approach things with 
okay, what's the first thing I can do? And the very first thing I did was start to listen to podcasts on my own. And then uh, I was approached by do, to do research for your Wow in the World app, uh, the Tinkercast app. And I was thrown into the experience um, and with the idea that it was okay to make mistakes, actually we wanted the mistakes to happen. And uh, we wanted to see what worked and didn't work. And I think that was what did it for me was having this unbridled experience of just going all in and seeing how the kids responded. Because the second you turn on the podcast and you lay the stage for what they're about to do, the magic happens. Um, and so I think just giving yourself to it. And as teachers, we are um, crazily overwhelmed and um, we have a lot on our plates. But think about it. You can turn on a podcast for 20 minutes and just breathe and listen and listen with the kids. That is really amazing. Um and where it goes from there, there's so many opportunities and possibilities. So I know that's just the first step. Um, and I'm learning right along with everybody else how to then keep engaging it in my room, including making podcasts like Martin does with his students. So Karen made me think of like where it started. And I so I like to run a lot. I've done a lot of um, running races around the United States. I've done 10 marathons before. Um, and I love to listen to podcasts while I'm running. I feel like I can, I can absorb more information that way. And as I started to, like loving podcasts, I would share with my kids too. And um, we'd be listening to in the car. And um, my daughter Evelyn would be really interested in learning about the different things that she learned around the world. And I'm like, maybe this is something I do with my students. So I brought into the classroom and my students that I work with in my resource room, uh, the students in special ed, Sometimes they're kind of like my uh, like my scientists, like the, my test subjects, like that we're just testing a lot of different things out. And if something is really resonating with them, it's going to resonate with their gen ed classroom. So they're, they're almost become the expert on using uh, while in the world or using other different uh, podcasts to listen to. And then once we bring them to the classroom, then we would use uh, tools like Flipgrid. In Flipgrid, you can uh, do short recordings, either video or audio. And that's how we would do, we would kind of say, these are our podcasts on Flipgrid and students be able to listen to each other, listen to each other's stories on Flipgrid and provide feedback to each other. So, I mean, that's how I did it. And it was a way of, to, of supporting literacy and gather, getting students to increase their vocabulary. But there's so many different ways to, to do, to use it. So I want to give a shout out to Jesse Buto in St. Paul, Minnesota. He's in St. Paul Public Schools. And he does podcasting where he'll have his students share their narratives. They'll share their personal stories. A lot of the students in St. Paul Public Schools are, are from marginalized backgrounds, marginalized groups. And giving the students an opportunity to share their narratives, share their stories, is a really great way of empowering them. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, there's just an infinite amount of all ways that you can use it. That's just one of the couple ways that you could do it. But, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. And where do you find them? Like, how do you, like, I mean, some teachers don't even know that there's it could be an app or a place to find them. Does anyone yeah, want to talk about Apple how they podcast? I like to use Stitcher. Um, that's a great way to find them. Uh, Common Sense Media, right? Has doesn't have a page of uh, podcasts for kids, right? Yeah. So that's that's really where we're we're really coming in and trying to fill that void for parents, for families, but also for educators. I think you know as we started to get closer to launching, I was thinking, who's going to be looking at this? Who's going to be coming here? And as I started to kind of understand the space and um, really kind of look into where it could be helpful in the education space, I was like, okay, how are we going to make sure that these podcasts are, we're giving enough information to where, yes, the family like and parents know the content that's in it, very just generalized, what are the positive messages? Is there any violent content? Is there any language? You know, simple like that, but really being more comprehensive in like our educational value grid where we talk about what is the educational value, really giving enough for the educator to not only be able to find the podcast, but to be able to understand its inner workings and how they might be able to use it. So we're, we launched with about 
I think at the time, 66 reviews. That is continuing to grow. We're hoping by the end of the year, we'll have um, about 250 to 300. Um, and we're, we are able to create these really great lists and they can be really nuanced lists that we could have like best science podcast for kids, but then we could have best science podcast for kids who like to get dirty. Right. So it could be like how they do like activities. So we can be really nuanced with our lists, which I really love because really what we want to be able to do, especially for the ed- educators who we know have so much on their plates is we want to do the vetting for you. That's what that's what we do. We vet these for you. We put them up and give you the information. But I think when we see the common sense name behind the rating, there's that sense of trust. And so we want to really be able to do that and create discovery, discoverability for teachers um, on the site. And we're trying to do that, you know, not only through our reviews, but through those lists and through articles um, that we'll really have up to, to guide teachers. So really just trying to be part of the, the solution. <laughs> and I would say that's a huge service also for those of us in the industry who are trying to make, you know, high quality work um, that we feel like is, um, you know, can get lost sometimes in the just fire hose of podcasts that are out there. And also, you know, as a practitioner, it's wonderful for me to see the stuff that rises to the top um, for you, for other people, I'm always like, oh, I haven't listened to that one yet. And it, it's such a rich uh, community of folks who are doing this kind of work right now. Um, and that helps all of us, I think, when there's um, there's an understanding that this work can be excellent and additive and can be useful in the classroom and all of that. That's a huge um, kind of rising tide moment for those of us who are also making making the uh, podcast. Yeah, I would I would plus one to that because, um, you know, the biggest problem in this industry, this industry is it's still a emerging niche of the children's media industry from, from the, from the, you know, content creation side of things. And the biggest problem to date has been discoverability. Um, when, when wow in the world and Tinkercast started five years ago, there weren't that many podcasts out there. There are, it's exploded. There are so many podcasts out there and so many of them are amazing. And so to how, how do you, you know, break through um, from a little app with a little thumbnail picture of what your podcast logo is? How does, how does someone actually push that and listen to it? Um, So we are, you know, the industry is so grateful for common sense media um, coming into this space and helping to rise some things to the top. And I do want to say, I I love that you bring up the kind of how it works for both the educator and the creator, because I think that's so important. The creator also needs to be able to know what the feedback from educators are so that they're creating content that works. Right. So we hope to be, and we've I've really been, you know, talking with creators like Meredith, like with Anne to really get an understanding of where they're coming from. Then, you know, talking with our education team and who's really out in the trenches with the teachers in the schools. And we're taking both of those sides and saying, how can we work together and how can we connect the creators with the educators? I think when that happens, there's this beautiful synergy. And that is when you're working toward what kids need, right? And not just what we want to make to make content. (laughs) Right, right. And something that has um, inspired us, you know, from the very beginning is that like we wanted kids to engage with their world and engage with real things that are happening in their world. And, you know, wow, in the world takes peer reviewed scientific research and makes a funny cartoon for the ear adventure. But that adventure is also like modeling the scientific, like what scientists do, which is to have a really curious question and follow that question and fail and try again and iterate and get messy. And, you know, so we're trying to like model the actual like the way scientists are really just curious kids themselves. (laughs) They're just a little taller. Um, (laughs) And um, so, you know, thinking about like the intention, because we know from speaking to teachers for so many years, 
that a lot of teachers are, are unlike Carol, um, don't, they're, they're generalist teachers that are ta tasked with teaching many different subjects. And um, they are least comfortable teaching science is what we've heard. So if we can be a tool to help teachers not think that they have to teach to the facts because facts change all the time, but to help to model and engage in the scientific principles of exploration and, and curiosity, you know, that's what we're really hoping to do and try to be a tool for teachers in that way too. And we have more subjects beyond science, but that's kind of our principle is like, how do you help people say wow about the real things happening in the world in a really innovative and engaging way? One thing that I really admire about the podcast that you and Anne are involved with and uh, the ones I've started to explore via Common Sense Media is that the process of learning transcends all subjects. And as a teacher, that's so critical because it's it's those cross-cutting concepts, to borrow a phrase from the next generation science standards, those are critical because we all want to be valuable and contributing citizens that have the ability to look at the world via that lens of being able to say, wow, I wonder, um, what if? And I think um, as adults, you know, sometimes we lose that magic. So it's good for us to be engaged with those as well. And for children, to, for that to become a habit. Um, and so what I really enjoy about podcasts is it naturally gives you a stepping off point for that moment. Any teacher can ask the question, why? Or what made you think of, what did you think of when you heard this? Uh, and that's as simple as it is. You know, when I think about what makes it easy to bring it into a classroom. It's just the simplest moment um, to use it as an engaging question, to use it as a warm up in your classroom. Um, and as creators are creating the content, the idea is to just think about that and to keep opening the educator's eyes to what the possibilities are. Um, I hope that's helpful. I really like, um, it's so important, I think, to have this content and for us to connect with it. And it's really neat how it's all coming together. Uh, so beautifully right now. And partnership, the partnership is probably the most valuable thing. I talk to the kids about what I do and the research that they are a part of, and they think that's the coolest thing in the whole entire world. So um, the, they, and that makes them want to do it themselves. So when Meredith, when you were speaking to relatability, these are real things happening in the world and the kids, they feel important when they get to hear that. So that's, is, that's a great thing as well. That's wonderful. Yeah, I mean, that's what we want. We want kids to have agency in their world, right? Um, is there anything else like Carol and Martin that you want industry professionals and podcast makers or kids media makers to think about as we are making content that could serve needs in the classroom? I'll go and then I'll let you go, Martin, too. <laughs> I think that's a um, big one. Yeah, my big thing, um, the common sense media situation and the partnership that I already see Laura, Meredith, and Anne having, that's really important to know that I'm engaging, engaging with content that's appropriate and that's been vetted by an expert. Yeah, I'm a science teacher, but I'm not an expert in all subjects. And I also love history, so I wind that in. I would like to know that it's appropriate and it's been thoughtfully listened to by an expert that can evaluate it in a certain way. Um, the other thing is, you know, when I think about when I started, I would have loved like a little, here's a guide, here's where you can start with step one, <laughs> step two. Um, and to just know how to really just get into it. Because I think sometimes it just seems like this unsurmountable mountain. And you're looking at it thinking like, oh, I have to do all of these things. And so to settle the glitter and to say, um, you can start here and that's just as valuable and to let teachers know that something like that is wonderful as well. Um, <clears throat> also to be able to identify and call out the topic or the subject that's being discussed in the podcast is really helpful so that I know it's about matter or Theodore Roosevelt, you know, I think, or both. Um, I think mm -hmm. that's helpful. Thanks, Carly. Give me some time to think. I'm like, what, what do I want? <laughs> okay. uh, so a few thoughts would be, um, the, first of all, just the importance of creating content like this that's engaging. And um, as a special education teacher, that this engaging content is important because it levels the playing field for a lot of the students. 
students who have disabilities, who struggle with reading, students who are English language learners. It just gives them another mode of, of, of information being re represented. And so like in schools, we talk about universal design for learning and that there's different ways for students, different pathways for students to learn. So that content, making that content is so important. Um, the other thing that I wanted to add would be that just to keep in mind, having all kinds of identities represented in the podcast, no matter whether it's nonfiction or fiction, it'd be great for students to see themselves or hear themselves, people like them in the podcast. And then I guess going back to a little bit of what I said earlier is that especially our students of color, our students who are the most marginalized, they need very structured, they, sometimes they miss out on structured uh, literacy. I keep on going back to literacy, but sometimes they miss those things. So I, I, I'm wondering if some of the teachers who are listening to the podcast right now are, are wondering, sometimes providing a podcast and be like, okay, just take that and learn from it is hard because it's not structured enough. So I think be able to provide podcasts and creators think about what ways can they scaffold information or organize information. Um, I think that's really important for teachers and students to be able to, okay, I have this, this podcast, what do I do with it? How do I use it to aid my way of doing research or asking questions? So yeah, those are a few things. Yeah, you're making me, th one thing I wanna really like acknowledge is Pinna has done an awesome job of creating resources that go along with all uh, the vast majority of the podcasts. And one thing as somebody who has worked in more formal ed tech was so great on uh, Quentin and Alfie was we were able to create lesson plans that really had those kind of scaffolds for like, before you listen, here's something you can do in the classroom. Here's something the kids can do while they're listening. Here's something they can do afterwards. Here's some activities that might extend or provoke a conversation you know, about that. Um, and so that I feel like when we as creators and people who are putting this content out in the world, we're doing a lot of research to get there in the first place. Like Meredith, you're, you know, reading those peer reviewed studies and like, those are, that's research that we've done that we can then repackage and provide to people who are then going to use that same content in the classroom. And I think it's like, it's so, it's so valuable to see that stuff go all the way through the other the other end and be and be communicated out and to this is sort of unrelated but to Martin's point about um, having all kinds of voices in in the stuff that we're creating I do think that as a medium you know voice is such an intimate thing and hearing people whether it's in your headphones or in your classroom and just hearing and focusing on voices really does evoke a sense of who it is that you're talking to. And so I think that's something that's so um, important. And I've seen a lot in kid testing too, is just kids being like, that sounds like my cousin, or, you know, I recognize my own voice or my own speech patterns or my own, you know, kind of perspective on the world. And I, Laura's done some awesome work sort of bringing forward podcasts that do that, I think really well. Um, but I think that's something that we have to be really sensitive to is that the the qualities of audio really make representation important in ways that, you know, I think um, it's easy from a theoretical standpoint to be like, you can't see what's going on. It's all, you know, but I think that there's an authenticity to the medium that really um, speaks to needing to take a lot of care with how we create and making sure that we're bringing different voices into the work that we're doing. Absolutely. Um, oh, um, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Meredith. I just wanted no, to no. add to what every like, kind of add to and bring everything together that everyone just said. It's, I think it's really amazing because, as Carol was saying, you know, all of our, all of our reviews are research back. We have so much research that goes into it in child development. So it's not just like we're like, oh, this is a great podcast, four stars. I think that maybe this age would like it. You know, there's so much and a reviewer any of our reviewers will tell you the kind of training they have to go through to look at all of our documentation and really understand like how am I putting that you know that that thought into is this there's a difference in if it's for four and up or like six and up and that difference is huge right so I you know we do put a lot of effort into that but I think that also from what Martin was saying you know what I love that we've done and what I love that we're able to kind of start off the, the podcast ratings and reviews with is right when I came on, we had just launched our diversity rubric, which guided us to add um, to what we call our content grid is just really where in the beginning of the review where you see like how, 
what's the educational value, how much positive messages, how many um, positive role models, right? And we break that kind of down um, with those. But we launched our diversity rubric, which then fed into our diverse representation content grid item. So that's its own item now where we call out um, how, who's represented in this podcast, who's speaking in this podcast. That's not just race, ethnicity, it's ability, it's gender, it's familial background, which is so, as a single parent, like that is huge for me because I would want my, my child to be listening to something where he sees his reality reflected while also seeing other realities reflected. So it's like understanding what this world is and the differences and to hear just everyone's perspective of what you want to know and what you want, a, you know, as a teacher and what you want, to, you know, the teachers in the education space to know as a creator, we really try to put all of our energy. Um, you know, I tell my reviewers, like, understand who's listening to this. And what I love about it is that our reviewers are teachers themselves. They are journalists. They are reviewers. They are, or excuse me, teachers. They are parents. So they're still coming from that perspective as well, which I think is really valuable. But I think everyone's input is really valuable for us to know how to really, what to put into these reviews so that educators really know and get a comprehensive view. That's great. <clears throat> um, I was also going to mention someone said something that made me think about the fact that like podcast listening is often shared. I mean, the majority of our listeners for our podcast are, are parents and kids actually like over 90% are listening together as a family during really important times of their day, the car ride, bedtime, breakfast time. So it's like a very um, personal moment that we're a part of. And we take that very seriously. But we've done um, research and surveys and hear from parents that they actually, what happens after you turn off that podcast, they continue the conversation, they're in this shared experience together. Um, they ask questions, they tell someone about it, they want to play it out and play in what they just heard. And so I think that there's so many lessons, like as we start to enter into um, creating content for teachers and you know, we have also have resources online at tinkercast.com for teachers that go along with every, every episode has activities that go along with it. But um, as we think about like how to get more into the classroom, I think it's a really important thing to remember. This is a shared thing and they want to keep doing it and, and talking about it and playing it out. Um, and so helping teachers to like figure out how they can keep that conversation and learning going because they are so engaged by listening. So how do you keep that engagement going well beyond the podcast is really important um, as well. And, and, and to the point about, you know, representation, I mean, that is, it is huge. One thing that's so beautiful about podcasts too, is that as Anne said, kids get to paint the pictures in their head themselves of what they're hearing. So if you have authentic characters, and of course we want voices and ages and differences represented, but so often we hear too, the kids see themselves in these characters um, because they're picturing they get to picture it and they can picture whatever they choose to picture, you know, um, which is a beautiful thing about, about the audio medium, I think too. Yeah. And one thing we haven't talked that much about, but I know, you know, Meredith and I, and I certainly think about too is kid testing and, you know, the, the, when we're talking to kids in the process of making things in the first place and how illuminating that process can be for creators, you know, so for people who are thinking about, you know, your, Carol's doing it in the classroom with the platform and, you know, but all along the way and as early as possible, kind of, there's so many surprises every time we put anything, you know, put a pair of headphones on kids and, and have them listen to it or in an open speaker. And, you know, we always learn things, I think, uh, from kids themselves, you know, we talked a lot about parents and teachers, but I, I also want to make sure we shout out how important kids themselves are to the development of the work that we're doing. Absolutely. Yes. And thanks to teachers that are, that are helping us do that oh, research yes. too, yeah. like Carol and Martin. Um, and so I know we wanted to also talk about like bridging the homeschool divide. I also know we want to leave some time for questions. So um, yeah, I think we have a couple of minutes left to just maybe talk a little bit about that homeschool bridge and then open it up. Does anyone want to start on that? I'll, yeah. I'll take that. It's um, 
So uh, just to give it a quick example, I started to assign homework listening of podcasts that have um, related to different topics, specifically at a fourth and fifth grade level. Uh, what it created was an interesting partnership between parents, children, and the classroom that we hadn't had before, because oftentimes the kids are, they're not allowed to use headphones, you know, parents are really careful in monitoring that at home. So everybody was experiencing it. So your classroom is moving into the home, and then the home is coming back into the classroom. And in the, today, uh, between teachers and families and schools, there is a need to create a different type of collaboration. And this is a really great spark for um, creating a co-learning environment or a professional learning community between a home and the classroom and the child. And the child, the child becomes the conduit. So they're the one traveling back and forth um, with that message and bringing things home and then back to the classroom. And it created something I wasn't expecting um, when I started to do it and then being able to talk with this group about it, you know, you start to identify, oh, that's what was happening. Um, podcasts are also a great way just to help parents learn, period. So you can be pushing information out and having them join you uh, in experiences that may be happening in your building, in your classroom with specific children or whatever that may be. Um, but the collaboration of all of the people involved with the child's education I mean, that's what enriches a child the most is when everybody is all in and they're hearing a consistent message and getting a consistent experience across all of the communities that they're a part of throughout the day. Does anyone want to add to that? One thing that I forgot to mention was half of the work that we have done, we did was during virtual learning. And so the students were, uh, we had like a podcast day of the week, like Fridays were our podcast day. And then we just kept it going once we were during the pandemic, the students, we just still did it. We still listed our podcasts like on Schoology for uh, students to work on them at home. And then, so I guess like the ability, the flexibility of, of having them be able to listen to it at school or home was great or in the car. And the other thing would be um, that they, um, for podcasting, uh, I would, during parent teacher conferences, t uh, parents would be asking me what podcasts would be the best for my, for my child. So we have those conversations too. So. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a really good point, Martin, about the pandemic too. I mean, we saw like our download numbers went skyrocketed within that first week that schools shut down. Uh, I think 94% increase, something crazy. And, you know, I think parents were looking for help, first of all, and educational resources. And they also were looking for that screen alternative as well, um, because there was so much happening on screens. All of a sudden, kids went from having limited screen time to all screen time. That's how they visited their grandparents. That's how they played games and saw their friends. That's how they were on school. So having that break from screens, I think, was also a really good thing um, the podcast provided during the pandemic um, as well. Yeah, yeah I, I know. Sorry, okay. I was going to say, I think that, you know, the other thing is we, that is where most parents are meeting my work certainly is not in the classroom, right? It's, it's in, it's in their podcast apps, it's at Penn, it's in other places where they're finding, you know, children's audio content. And so, you know, creating stuff that uh, works for a parent at home or a family in the car, as you're saying, you know, but then has the potential to expand and be enriched by a classroom experience and a, a wonderful teacher or facilitator who can help draw additional things out in that work is something you know we think about a lot is all the different spaces that these shows make you know audio can be anywhere basically even more so than you know everybody's got the iPads in the back of the car now but even so you know it's it's a it's a medium that follows you to so many different places and is, is popping up in so many parts of kids' lives. And so I think as a creator, it's extremely exciting to think like, wow, someone can really do a deep dive on this or dig in or, you know, spend some time unpacking pieces of it in a classroom setting that is kind of beyond, you know, where my imagination was at the beginning of, of a creative process. So it's really, it's really gratifying and exciting. And is there I anything say, anyone wants to make sure we say before we open up to questions? I feel like this is like our last couple minutes to make sure we're saying all the things that we wanted to share with this audience. So is there any last thoughts from the group? And then Laura, I know you're, you are 
you have one right now. <laughs> I have one right now. Surprise. Um, yeah, I just want to just add on and then add one last thing. I think, um, I think the research that we've seen out there just in podcast listening in general, that's like more for 18 and up, but this always kind of, of course, trickles down to our families and children is that listening for both Black and Latino listeners, listenership, went up significantly during the pandemic. There's research from Edison out there that has shown that. And a lot of that listening was co-listening, especially in Latino families. So I think one thing that we really, I really encourage my reviewers to do is make sure you're putting something into that review to talk about co-listening. We want to know, we want to say like things you'll see in our reviews, like This is also something that will, you may stay around as an adult while your kid is at school and listen to this podcast because I've been listening to a lot of kids' podcasts, obviously. And as an adult, I will listen to these podcasts off of work time. So it's, it's great to be able to have that resource to understand that. And I would just say, you know, kind of as an ending point on our end is that um, when it comes to discoverability too, and I don't think I mentioned this you know, in our reviews, we do have um, a section like on the actual review that's if you like this podcast, you may like this podcast. And we add additional podcasts that are that are like that podcast or in the realm of that podcast. So that's another way for parents and teachers to say, oh, this is really cool. Where should I go next? And there's that resource. And we'll also link to books, right? Like with Wow in the World that are related to that podcast, other forms of media that are related to that podcast, because then you have a whole package, right? You have different ways of including this podcast um, with other forms of media. So I'm just, I'm really just grateful to be here with all of you and that this space is growing and continuing to really help educators and families prepare for it to be the next kind of household medium. Any other uh, thoughts that everyone wanted to get across before we open it up? I just have one thing I want to say, which is that um, part of the reason I was excited to be a part of this this conference is that this is about games and interactivity. And um, so we have been doing a lot of work uh, on developing an ed tech platform called Tinker Class. Um, so you can check it out, tinkerclass.com. It's, we're in beta testing right now with it. That is what Carol was testing to help go from the podcast to a project-based learning um, activity that's 21st century skill building as well as subject all subjects building so um, I just wanted to put that plug in there for teachers to know about what we're doing beyond just the podcast thank you Carol um, okay so is somebody helping us moderate questions here I see two questions in there um, one from Matthew McGowan and Lorena to Boas. I probably said that wrong. Um, but Matthew McGowan asked, these research findings sound amazing. Might there be something like a centralized source that collects such research? That would be a great idea, Matthew. I have to say a lot of the research I have found is very old. It's like from the 80s. <laughs> Um, so I also think that there is a great need for more modern research um, now that podcasts have emerged on the scene. This, that probably was radio play that they were testing back in the 80s. So, um, yes, that would be a great thing to learn about. Um, I don't know of anything right now that's collecting that information. Does uh, know? If you reading Rockets, I, oh, I, I don't know if readingrockets.org or .com, but they have a few... Um, how would I say, like interventions that use podcasts that are based off of research. It's not a centralized location, but at least it's something that's evidence-based. Yes, and there's also ListenWise, which is another platform. I think it's slightly older ListenWise, but I think that they have a lot of um, research backing what they're doing, and I've read a lot of research from their side as well. Um, the other question was for Laura. She said, Laura, I'm curious to know if there are obstacles teachers may face while using podcasts in the classroom. I can answer some pieces of that as well. Yeah, I, I think Carol could probably answer that better than I can. I mean, what I know from 
and it, maybe it's not so much obstacles that they're already facing. I think what I know from the webinars we've done so far and the, you know, what we've heard from teachers so far, so early on and kind of introducing this on our end um, is really they just want a very like clean breakdown uh, from start to finish or we'll just like start <laughs> to pressing play of where do I go? You know, there's so many different listening apps. I think it can be like, do I have to go to one? Can I only be using a Mac? Can I only be using a Chromebook? Can I, do I have to have an app? Can I get it on a website? Right. So really breaking those things down is what seems to be something for, for educators who haven't used podcasts in the space yet. Um, it seems like it's a lot of foundational elements, but I, I'd like to hear from Carol on this. Can and, I just say one quick thing, though? It is mm -hmm. platform agnostic. So podcasts yeah. are free. They are free. They are Most of them are free. There are some services that you have to pay a subscription, but most of them are free and they live on many different places and they are accessible on whatever device you choose to listen on. Carol, if you want, I know it's time. So um, Carol, if you want to just add a, a final thought on that, that would be great. Um, it really is about just you, what, what media or what platform you are comfortable with. So for example, if you want to stream it to an Apple TV in your classroom, or you want to play it from a portable speaker, um, and you can try multiple ways, but I think if the teacher is comfortable with utilizing it there, um, as a teacher or as any teacher knows, there are limits on how long children will listen developmentally. Um, and how you want to scaffold that in your room. Those are what I call the nuts and bolts, kind of the technical challenges that you could um, face. And I'm wondering if in her question, she might be referring to, you know, are there issues with privacy or considering usage or whatever? Um, I did not run into any of that and I haven't had colleagues that have run into that either. Um, this is with the backing of Common Sense Media, that kind of gives you a different um not a certification, but a thumbs up that this is a positive process to use. And because like wow in the world is so tied to curriculum, it's a really useful thing along with any podcast, there's ways to tie it in there. Um, but the nuts and bolts are what the obstacles are, but I wouldn't call them obstacles. I would call them like the little jumpy things that you have to get over when you're doing uh, training for soccer or something like that. <laughs> the jumpy things. <laughs> the jumpy, nice. jumpy things. I'm going to read yes. something It's not an obstacle. It's a little jumpy thing. A, a little jumpy thing. thing. Well, let's leave that at that. And, I, <laughs> um... <laughs> and just to um, let you know, we do have on our reviews on Listen On, it has a drop down of all the location, the listening platforms that those um, podcasts are on and as well as the website and the run, the average run time. So that's all there in one place. That's great. And now at tinkercast.com, we also have like a little subscribe button and you can pick mm -hmm. where you want to subscribe, subscribe so you get new episodes each time they're dropped. So, okay. Well, thank you guys. This was a great discussion and it's been really great to get to know you guys better in this process leading up to it as well. Thank you for joining Thanks, everybody. everybody. That's thank, you. thank you so much, thank everyone. You.